Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll begin if we may. Uh, my name is Simon Goto, I'm the director of CRASH, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Michaelmas term CRASH Impact Lecture. And our impact lectures are designed to uh, bring uh, people who can have some impact to talk about topics of major modern importance that may have some rel relation to policy. Uh, next term we'll have Sarah Ahmed coming to talk about uh, race and gender, continuing that series from last year. But today we're going to be talking uh, about China, and we're going to be talking about China uh, with Michael Puitt, who is the Professor of Chinese History from Harvard University. Tomorrow at 6 o'clock, not at 5.15, at 6 o'clock, we were going to, we're going to go to the Riley Auditorium in Clare College, where we will continue this uh, event with a discussion, talk, debate between uh, Michael Puert and Julia Lovell, chaired by Hans van der Ven. And I hope you'll all come back at 6 o'clock, and it should be uh, tomorrow, it should be a splendid event. Uh, once again, if you need all the details, they're on the Crash website. But it's my pleasure tonight to introduce, simply enough, Michael Pruitt, Professor of Chinese History at Harvard, to give the Crash Impact Lecture. Thank you. Great, so thank you so much, Simon, for, for inviting me here. It is such an honor to be here, and to all of you for coming. I'm honored to be part of the CRASH environment. I've long been a, been a fan of CRASH and all the CRASH is trying to do, and it's such an honor to be part of it today. So thank you and thank all of you. So what I will be talking about today is China and neoliberalism, a kind of um, odd companion, to put it mildly, particularly now, since China is at least making claims that it's going to offer something other than neoliberalism, and that is a claim that, quite rightly so, has been viewed with a lot of cynicism. So to, let up, to set apart my argument here, let me begin by giving a brief description of neoliberalism, because this term gets popped around a lot. So let's quickly review what neoliberalism is, briefly what its history is, and then review it once we put China into the narrative. So at first, therefore, I will leave China out. And let me just begin with a very standard narrative so we're all in the same plane here. So neoliberalism begins, as the name correctly implies, as an attempt to return to classical liberal views of economics. It emerges in the 20th century with who were viewed at the time as very, very radical fringe right-wing figures, um, Hayek, of course, Milton Friedman, who were making arguments that the only way to build an, a workable economic system is by returning to classical liberalism. These ideas very surprisingly began to actually take hold among more and more of what were still fringe right groups, but, but increasingly so, over the course of the 1970s. And in response to the global economic crisis of the 1970s, quite stunningly begins having extraordinary political success. Most famously, of course, in the UK with Margaret Thatcher, in the US with Ronald Reagan, these ideas actually come to power. And much more significantly in some ways in terms of the actual policy, in the 1990s, you actually get the opposition parties in both areas largely accepting these principles. And of course, because they're coming from the opposition parties, this is the moment when, in the 1990s again, when a lot of these ideas become major policies in both the UK and the US, and then spreading out throughout the world. In the US version of this, this even comes to be called the, the Washington Consensus, by which was implied, well not implied, literally explicitly stated to be a consensus view that both political parties fully accepted and going very quickly, that argument goes along the following lines. You should, first of all, deregulate the economy so the government structure should be as minimal as humanly possible. The goal of that deregulation is to allow free market principles to run everything. Um, I use the word everything in a strong um, tone of voice because or obviously the claim was economically this should be the case, but the further claim was that actually it should really be all aspects of human society. And the full argument goes along the following lines. Human beings are inherently self-interested creatures. 
And what we need to do is design as many institutions as possible that both accept this, but therefore begin functioning on market principles. Obviously, this is true economically, but we should do everything working this way. So the government should function on market principles. The educational system should function on market principles. Absolutely everything should. Because this becomes the Washington Consensus, it then is strongly, that's even putting it too mildly if this is possible, supported by the major international institutions. It becomes very quickly a global phenomenon. Trade pacts are, are signed throughout the world um, enforcing these ideas. Um, entire banking systems and loan systems are run assuming these sets of ideas, by which I mean governments that tried to push against it could literally be bankrupted, meaning very quickly that governments had no choice but to accept this. And then slowly but surely, over the subsequent decade, you get a de facto administrative structure running, running the entire global economy that is based upon these principles. This is what we call neoliberalism. It is, as I've been arguing, an economic and a political ideology. But as you're also noticing very quickly, it's much more than this. And let me just bring in a few more terms that are being developed over the course of these few decades that become part and parcel of this kind of neoliberal orthodoxy. So I mentioned the crucial transition in many ways is from the 80s, when it first achieves political prominence through the major electoral victories of Thatcher and Reagan, but the turning point is really the 1990s. And in the US, this is absolute, there's an absolute sort of moment when this occurs, and that absolute moment is the fall of the Berlin Wall. In 1989, this all that I've just been mentioning, what was at that point seen as a conservative ideology, is taken up to be much more than this. So there's a very famous book written by Francis Fukuyama called The End of History. And the explicit argument of the book, very tellingly, was the fall of the Berlin Wall isn't simply the end of the Cold War. It, in fact, is something much more significant. It is the end of an entire period of history, history with a capital H. And the full argument is all of human history, for all of human history until basically the 19th century, humans were governed by traditional societies, traditional ideologies, traditional religious belief systems. Humans sadly were born into these systems. They did things like ritual that taught them what to do, that socialized them into a social role, that socialized them into a religious belief. And humans simply had no choice but to simply play a role within these traditional systems. Fortunately for humanity, Modernity then begins in the 19th century, in the West, of course. And when this happens, humans for the first time realize that they can begin to create societies on their own. And they don't need to simply accept the traditional world into which they are born. This results in the formation of different isms. Communism, socialism, fascism, capitalism, and the next 150 years basically involves a set of wars, at times hot, at times cold, between these different isms. And Fukuyama's argument is now, in 1989, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the era of the wars of the ism has, isms has come to an end. And one of these has won, but of course the full argument is the correct one has won. And this view is the correct one, because it accurately maps what humans are really like. It attempts to build an entire world, again, not just economic, but political, educational, everything, based upon that correct view of human beings. And it therefore should be thought of, it wasn't a descriptive argument, it's a normative argument, it should be thought of as the end of history with a capital H, with the explicit argument being, therefore, stop thinking that there are other possibilities. You certainly don't want to go back to the traditional world, that's very clear by the way it's portrayed, and stop thinking that there are other possibilities either, because that's simply going to lead you to think there are other isms, and then the hot and cold wars of the past century and a half return again, rather accept we have come to an end, we have reached the, the proper way of understanding the world, and now just live within it. <laughs> 
In fact, he goes farther than saying live within it. What he really says is um, do what you're asked to do in this, which is, of course, you know, be an economically productive person, but you know, putting a good spin on it, um, realize yourself. And this is part and parcel of an entire ideology that has now become so much a part of our accepted wisdom. It's important to remember there's a history to this, where, and I'll give the specific American examples of this, but various versions of this are popping up in the UK too, of course. And the way it's said in the US are things like, okay, now that we've figured out everything, you know, the political system, the economic system, we figured out how things work, and we now know how to run things properly, what every individual must do is simply look within and find yourselves. Just find yourself, find your true self. And what you should do is by finding yourself, once you've done this, then decide how you can fit in, given who you are, your, your true essence, how you can fit into this world. And so we even design tests, this is really true, um, that students still take amazingly, tests that help students find out who they are. And it kind of tests, like this is really true, and it kind of tests like, like what they're gifted at. Um, so it tries to test, are you good at X, Y, and Z? Are you personality type X, Y, or Z? I unfortunately don't know the, the terminology, but they have a whole array of different personality types and, and different um, gifts and, 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 and strengths that, that each individual supposedly has. And then once you take the test, it will say, okay, here are the good career options, given who you are and what you're gifted at being, and here are the really bad career options, because they're things you're not good at doing, they're not you. Um, and then the idea was, um, and I'll again use the terms used so often in America, love and embrace yourself for who you really are. This is really said constantly. And love, of course, your good sides, which is why you take these tests to find out. But, you know, love the fact that we have bad sides too, and we just don't follow them in our careers, but, you know, that's just part of who you are, and so you love that and be sincere and true to who you are. And then, with the help of things like these tests, you can actually then find your place in this new global world that we're creating for you. And so, literally, once you take these tests, it will say, here are the careers that are good for you. And then the idea was you would sort of, according to what is your own self-interest, according to who you are and what your gifts are, you find a good career that you can fit in to very well in this world, and you work hard, you're industrious in this career, and you will have a successful career because you'll find a good match based upon who you are with the world out there, and you will have a successful career. And as long as everyone does this, right, is tr true and sincere to their true selves, they will be successful, they will be happy and fulfilled, they will be self-realized individuals, and of course, they will be productive in this new global neoliberal order we're creating, and the result will be economic success for the world, as well as, by definition, individual fulfillment. This is the end of history. This is why you don't ask how should we organize the world? Are we doing the right thing? Because by definition, that forces you into other isms, right? Other ways of thinking there might be alternatives and you're not supposed to think this. This, of course, is the view that becomes extraordinarily successful. Now, it wasn't the first time, I mean, very famously, Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s had made the same argument. In fact, she even used the expression, quoting back earlier liberal thinkers, saying, there is no alternative. But of course, in the 80s, there were other alternatives. <laughs> and, and, I mean, and, 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 and she was not actually, you know, despite the way it's been portrayed later, was not that popular, actually. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, so, so she's trying to say, you know, there are no alternatives, but she's saying that because clearly there were. Um, this new vision, however, kind of wins the day. And when we speak of the Washington Consensus, I mean, that's a very accurate term in the sense that basically, at least in America, no political party would go against anything I've said. They, they, they had slight variations of it, so the debates would be, you know, should the high, highest tax rate be 39% or 35%? That was literally the debate. Um, you know, the fact that, that before, in the 1980s, tax rates in America went up to 91%, was just, I <laughs> mean, that was unthinkable. So the debates between the political parties were sort of the minor pieces of this, 
but basically that world was accepted. Then, of course, um, something seems to have happened in these past two years. Still, let me leave out China, but oddly, um, there seem to be alternatives popping up. Um, many of them alternatives that many of us would not be terribly happy with, but at least the claim there's no alternative no longer appears to be an empirically accurate statement. What you're now getting, of course, is very strong resistances to this neoliberal system, and from ways that frankly ought not have been remotely surprising. Um, neoliberalism is called neo because, of course, it's, it's an attempt to return to classical liberalism. This has played out before, and um, gee whiz, surprise, surprise, it's playing out again kind of like it did before. Um, you start creating a system like this, and what you start getting, surprise, surprise, is extraordinarily wealth growth with a very, very tiny lead, so obviously this is supportive of, you get a tremendous, tremendous impoverishment of everyone else. Surprise, surprise, that leads to incredible levels of anger of people who are not going to be you know, looking within and finding themselves and being sincere and taking our little tests, but people who are livid about what is happening to their lives. And now you're getting the spread of right-wing authoritarian movements, strong reactions against the system. At least the way this is often portrayed in America, tellingly, and I'll again use some of the terms that are often used, is, well, too bad. <laughs> but basically what this is, is simply people who can't quite take the new neoliberal world, um, and, and they haven't yet realized it's, it's ultimately going to lead to the enrichment of, of everyone. And since they can't quite take it, sadly, they're turning back to traditional things. They're turning back to things like religions, and they're turning back to other forms of organization. They're trying to go back to the traditional world, but of course the sense is, from this point of view, that by definition will fail, because you know, this is not only modernity, it's, it's the final form of modernity, and so we simply need to kind of wait out this, this, <laughs> this moment, and eventually you know, people will begin getting economically prosperous, and they'll buy into the system, and, and then everything will be perfectly fine. So it's a momentary blip, but nothing really to worry about. And finally, let me bring in China and mention the way China is often discussed from this narrative. And again, I'll just use the terms that pop up constantly. This is, again, mainly in the US press, but not, not restrictively so. This pops up very much in the UK and, in that fact, through much of Europe, too. And the way China is put is kind of um, a variant of the way these populist movements are discussed. And so China is often discussed as one of the last areas where, sadly, modernity hasn't yet completely taken hold. And the way it's often put is to say, well, China, of course, accepted the, the wrongism, you know, accepted communism, um, so sadly for them. And then when the wall fell, unfortunately, it didn't in, in China, and so China continues the communist system. But then the view is, nonetheless, luckily for them, they began some, to open up markets in a few cities, and in the 1990s, lo and behold, these markets take off extraordinarily, and the result over the next couple of decades is an incredibly, incredibly vibrant economy. And now the argument is China is kind of facing this battle between this very vibrant economy and still this very authoritarian traditional state. And sort of the future of China depends on how that battle will play out. So either the neoliberal reforms will continue. You'll get a middle class that will emerge. That middle class will call for democratic reforms. And you'll get a good neoliberal system in China, and it will join the world community um, fully. Or it won't, and you'll still have a continuation of a traditional authoritarian system that won't be willing to allow the market to fully be free. And as such, ultimately, their huge economic gains will be lost. And ultimately, China will cease to be what it otherwise could have been, which is a significant world power, and then it may take a few more generations, but hopefully someday it will finally open up and join the modern world. And so China is kind of the last holdout of a traditional way of thinking and a traditional state that won't quite give up its hold on power.
So that's where we are with the way often the entire neoliberal system is thought about and the place, or lack thereof, of China. So today what I would like to do is argue first the easy part, that almost all of this narrative as it's understood is wrong and dangerously so. That's going to be the easy part of the argument, easy. <laughs> then what I want to do is bring in China as offering some things that might pose serious questions to a lot of our assumptions when we make this narrative. And to do so, what I'm going to do is be pulling on a large amount of indigenous theories in China from Chinese past, political theories, economic theories, social theories, look at how those have been debated. I will also be discussing how many of these were implemented, the implications in Chinese history, very much up to and including the present day, and how at least some of these theories, um, I'm not going to argue should be made into isms, we'll see very quickly they should not, but rather how they should challenge some of our assumptions that are undergirding our narrative of neoliberalism, and yes, perhaps open up some serious questions that among many other things very quickly will make us realize, not just theoretically, but in practice, boy, are there alternatives. And one of the greatest dangers is the incredible success by which we have been convinced that there are none. So to, to move into this, let me begin with some of what I at least, and I suspect probably most of you too would agree, are some of the most chilling theories that arose in China about how to build a successful system politically, economically, and socially. Um, for the specialists here, I will be pulling mainly on Han Feidze, who's one of the great classical political theorists from China. And Han Feidze is building upon lots of theories that had arisen in the previous few, several centuries that he's taking and kind of um, turning on their head. And very quickly, those arguments run along the following lines. Um, to begin with, um, are we creatures who have some true self that we should always be looking and trying to find and then seeking in terms of what is in our best interest for this true self we have, um, what to do, both in terms of a large sense of, a, of finding our, a career, et cetera, as well as in terms of just sort of deciding and navigating everyday day life according to what is in our best interests. Um, uh, no. <laughs> um, rather, the argument is, Think of human beings as a mess of different energies and dispositions and tendencies. A messy, messy, messy bunch of different energies and dispositions and tendencies. And think of human interactions um, as involving, at sort of if you think putatively from a very young age, of these messes interacting with other messes. And when these messes interact with other messes, what we do is we drag out different energies from each other constantly. So someone will yell at me, and it drags out from me an energy of anger. Someone smiles at me. I get happy because it's dragging out from me. That, that smile is dragging out from me an energy of happiness. And our danger, as you can see quickly, is that we are purely passive in this. And then the argument goes the next step, because very quickly what tends to happen to us as human beings is we don't simply respond to things in the way I just mentioned, because what quickly starts happening is we start falling into patterns of interaction. So in my examples I just gave, someone smiles at me and it drags out from me this energy of happiness. Someone yells, it drags out from me an energy of anger. Except what quickly happens, the argument continues, is as I get slightly older, so from two to three or four, from a very young age, I cease to even start to cease to even stop, cease to react, I should say, to things that are actually happening. So someone else will do something that for whatever reason reminds me emotionally of that person who yelled at me. It equally drags out for me that energy of anger. And the same thing with someone who reminds me of someone who smiled at me. In other words, I'm not even responding to the actual world around me. I'm responding by pattern. Now, if you take this view seriously, 
The argument that Hanfetz is going to react against is to say, our goal, therefore, is to cease this world where we're simply responding by pattern, and what you're trying to do intentionally is create breaks in the world around us. So you do things like, for example, rituals, which from this point of view involve forcing people to, for that brief moment, become a different person, seeing the world from a different perspective, interacting with those around them in a different way than they usually do, the purpose being not to socialize them into being the thing in that ritual, the purpose being to force some kind of break. And by doing this constantly, by having tons of these rituals, what you're slowly trying to do is refine humans' possibilities of responding to the world around us. In other words, to gain a sense of refinement so that you begin to see the world, oneself and those around us, as messy. And you begin to see how these patterns are playing out. And you become capable, slowly over time, of becoming someone who can begin to alter the kinds of patterns that humans are constantly falling into. The argument, not surprisingly, being usually when people are passively falling into patterns, they're usually extraordinarily dangerous ones for us and those around us. And these patterns can last decades, our entire lifetimes, indeed, they can last for centuries. And these patterns can become so interlocked in forms of human interaction that you can continue for centuries of humans just repeating these same patterns over and over and over again. Now, if this is a view of the self, let's turn to Hanfei. So Hanfeza comes a few centuries after these theories are being developed, and you actually get practices developed around the ideas I've been mentioning, and even economic and political theories they'll be touching on a bit later, based upon this idea of how you alter the fact that we fall into these dangerous patterns of interaction. Hanfeza's conclusion, however, is suppose we do the opposite. Suppose we take seriously the fact that we human beings do fall into these patterns of interaction. And suppose you take that as your goal. And Han Feidze, as he's developing this, is building upon some theorists who he thinks didn't quite get this about human beings. And so he's building on some theorists, we'll later call them legalists, who will argue that what you need are things like strong forms of law, of punishments, to build an incredibly strong centralized state that can, that can build huge public infrastructure, that can take control of all material resources, including the population, and organize all of this effectively. And the way you get people to accept this is you build such incredible fear in the population by just the viciousness and the regularity of the punishments that people won't dare stand up against you. And Han Feidze, looking at this, thinks, well, that vision of the state is great. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. But the problem is it would never work in practice. And he's actually looking at states that tried to do this. And he said, actually, what happens is you build a system like this, and what you get is, yes, a very fearful population, but you get a fearful population that despises and resents the state and is kind of looking for any conceivable opportunity to react against it. And so the state may be successful for periods of time if it's you know, just strong enough, but it's only a matter of time until it begins to falter and people begin to overthrow it. And so it's, it's just planting the seeds for its own destruction. And so Han Feitz's response is, well, suppose we don't base it upon fear at all. Suppose, on the contrary, that what we do is create a system that's so incredibly regular and consistent, and it involves all aspects of the world, not just the political world, but all aspects, such that humans simply, over time, will, and I'll use some of his terminology, he's building upon the louds and when he says this, will simply come to accept this as natural. It's just the world they live in. And what you try to do is you try to organize everything like this such that it just becomes the way people live. 
And by definition, there's no alternative because it simply becomes who you are. And if you could organize the world this way, there won't be resistance to it because, of course, that will be the world people will live in. People won't be fearful and resentful against a state because they will simply be part of that world. And that world will be simply be part of them in a very literal sense. And the patterns of interaction will simply be the entire patterns of everything they are doing. And if we can create a world like that, that is how you can effectively rule things. Because no one will even think that you're ruling them. You will actually effectively be simply part of a world that everyone will accept as the world, and that is how you successfully make things work. And then when you look at various attempts in Chinese history to put this in place, um, not surprisingly, it can turn out to be quite effective. And at times, this is done in terms of overt political policy, where people will literally try to do this at the state level. You can also see, once you're thinking in terms of this as a possible mode of being in the world, you can also look at various movements in Chinese history that really aren't, I think, intentionally thinking in such cynical ways as the way Han Fates is, is overtly thinking, but in practice are doing this. So you get many movements in Chinese history that actually could be read this way, even though I think it's not overtly something that, that leaders were intentionally trying to do to kind of you know, <laughs> control the population. Um, you, in fact, get many of these. Let me just give you a pre han Feizian example to strongly emphasize the point that this is being done, at least in my opinion, not by someone trying to you know, control the population, but trying simply to build a perfectly coherent world that would lead to order. Um, think, for example, of a very early pre han movement called the Moists. So the Moists, for the non-specialists in, in the class, I'm sorry, in the, um, in the lecture here, is um, it's a I'll go ahead and use the word, it's a religious movement that's, yes, founded by a charismatic religious leader, and it is an attempt to create what I think we should call, and I'll come back to this, an ism. Um, so I have no problem calling this Moism. And it's an attempt to actually build an entire world in which you will convince all the adherents that they must reject all the rituals that are being done around them, and truly believe that the world they are living in is a coherent world and a moral world that is created by a moral deity called heaven. Heaven has created this world, and that world is governed by heaven, and under heaven is an entire bureaucracy of ghosts who are not, contrary to the basis of all of the religious practices of the day, who are not potentially capricious and often highly dangerous figures who you're trying to do sort of this kind of ritual, in the sense I was using the word before, you're kind of trying to work with in ritual ways to build different relationships other than the usually very dangerously antagonistic ones that dominate our dealings with, it, with the ghosts. And instead the argument is, no, no, no. The ghosts are good. The ghosts are good and in fact, they're rigorously good. And so the ghosts come down and reward us every single time we do something good and always punish us every single time we do something badly. And therefore, as long as we act properly according to the guidelines of heaven, we will be rewarded. And if we don't, of course, we'll be punished, but properly so, and it's absolutely regular. And what we now need to do is build an entire government structure directly modeled on this. And if we do this, we will create a world where everyone will so act perfectly in accord with the heavenly guidelines, perfectly. And the only reason people aren't acting this way, and therefore foolishly don't think they're living in a coherent moral world in which people are always being rewarded if they're good, since that doesn't ever seem to actually happen, that's because we have sadly not followed these precepts, 
we are incorrectly doing all of these other rituals that are creating these alternate modes of being. And if we stop that and truly believe, then we'll simply realize we are living in a different world than we think we're living in. And over time, once we create a governmental structure that's actually based upon such a vision, everything will operate accordingly. To give another example, later millenarian movements, different terminology, but very similar. There's a high deity, oftentimes not called heaven, it's often called Lao Tzu, or there are different terms given to it, who has created a moral universe, given us clear precepts. We must simply see the world as this higher deity is asking us to see it. We must cease doing things like rituals, and we must simply live in, and believe we are living in, which is the key, in this perfect world. And if we so do, then we will recognize that in fact, what seems to be empirically this messy, capricious world that we think we're living in, we'll realize we're not living in that world, and slowly we truly won't because we will create, of course, but the claim is not we'll create, we will see we are living in a different world that will rather be perfectly moral and perfectly orderly. And these movements continue. Um, you at the moment, to give a not random example, see a tremendous resurgence of Pentecostal Christianity, which involves many, many similar claims. I mean, in China, not I mean, throughout the world, obviously, but in China, which involves many similar claims. Um, and let's expand this. I'm giving Chinese examples. Um, let's look at other movements that actually fit this line very clearly. Um, Calvinism, um, very similar. So you get the emergence of Calvinism with a strong argument that let's wipe out all these traditional rituals. Let us recognize that the world is in fact a coherent and a coherently moral world. All humans have this true self given to us by this perfectly moral figure. If we follow the true calling given to us by this moral deity, and live according to our true calling, sincerely believing in our true calling and the world created by this higher deity, we, by definition, will be saved, but we will also be part and parcel of creating, but again, the, the word creating is, is, is not the correct one, of seeing accurately that we live in such a moral world, and the degree to which we currently don't is simply because we, doing things like ritual, etc have created a very different world than the true world that we are in fact living in, but we simply don't see it because of all of these other things that we have created. Now, I'll give the obvious example, <laughs> um, but then I will undermine it too. But let me just continue to what is now the, the next obvious move. Um, I would like to argue the word modernity is part and parcel of a similar type of claim. To make it in strong terms, one of my many recommendations I'll be making at the very end of this lecture, but I'll go ahead and make it now, is we should cease to use the word modernity. We can use it when people claim to be modern, but we should not ever use it as an analytic category. And here's why. All of the modernity narratives, all of them, involve the exact same set of claims that I've just been mentioning, but unlike at least Han Feidze, who's admitting that we're constructing this world, we are rather, on the contrary, um, believing in them. The modernity narratives involve the explicit claim. Wipe away tradition, get rid of these silly rituals that are again read from this point of view as simply things that socialize us into ways of being and ways of thinking. Everything, therefore, is going to be made into a new world that will truly be the true world, and a world where we as individuals can truly live. And then the different isms, returning to Fukuyama's argument, are simply different attempts to build these coherent orders. And yes, neoliberalism, obviously, is simply the latest and stunningly effective version of this, stunningly effective just because it goes so global, in which you actually get an attempt to build an entirely coherent world based upon these claims of individuals as having something called a true self, 
that with inherent gifts that we should always be following and being true to, and somehow that we live in a world where if we follow what is in our best interest given who we are, we will, you know, by definition, realize ourselves, but also be productive in this larger world, and somehow this is going to lead to an economically prosperous order when both when it was done before, before we had Neo, and now that it's being done again, by any possible indicator, obviously none of this is happening. It's been an economically disastrous, except for this tiny um, group of people, and yet we're not supposed to notice this because ultimately it's going to work, and if we don't think we're living in the world that we're being told we live in, just keep living in it and believe in it, and eventually it will all work out, and we will be fulfilled, and we'll all be wealthy and prosperous, and there will be economic success, and it really will work out. A perfect Hanvadesian system. But then, that only raises the obvious questions. Um, if we're going to, just for the sake of argument, get rid of all of our isms, get rid of all of our modernity narratives, and reject all of the things that are said about traditional societies, um, you might correctly say, well, isn't that kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Because um, certain good things have surely emerged from the modern world, <laughs> to put it politely, and how can we get rid of this? So let me go back to China. And let me sketch an alternate way of thinking about all of these sets of issues. So, so far I've been discussing political theories that are based upon creating these coherent worldviews and arguments about how you do it. Um, let me now return to other views about possible ways of building worlds. My argument not being these are better ways, but arguing they at least break us from a lot of our fundamental assumptions. So let me take a quick look at those and the ways they were implemented and raise some questions that I think we should be thinking about in our own political, social, and economic theories. So what are the indigenous economic, political, and social theories that emerged from the views of the self I was mentioning before in which you're intentionally saying, we do not have a coherent self unless we build a world that so makes coherent selves. In other words, that are based upon the ideas that we, by definition, construct the world we're living in, either passively or self-consciously, but either way, what we become depends on these patterns of interaction that we can either fall into not realizing we're doing it or that you're constantly working on. What Han Feitzer was rejecting was the argument, and this is very explicit, that if you take this view of the self seriously, what you explicitly want to do if you're building a political system is create different spheres. Because within any given sets of spheres, we will develop patterns of interaction that by definition may develop certain good sides, but almost by definition equally will open up great dangers. And so what you're intentionally trying to do is think of the world as involving different spheres. So, to give a not random set of examples, um, you can create, and this term is crucial here, there's nothing natural about this, you can create a market. Markets are not natural. If a state stops doing anything, you don't get a market. <laughs> Markets are created things. It involves an incredibly powerful state that will define humans, define patterns of interaction, build legal systems, build forms of control, and the state is deciding what is defined as the set of, of figures and things and institutions being regulated by the laws and how those laws are run and how those regulations are working. Markets are created. You can create a market and you get explicit theories about how you do it. And lo and behold, they sound a lot like our theories of markets, except gone, absent, in fact, explicitly <laughs> rejected, is any claim that there's anything natural about a market. Nothing is natural. So a state can create a market, and in certain arenas of human life, markets can be wonderful. They can create vibrant economic orders, but then you need other things to block the dangers of markets. You need, for example, the bureaucratic states that are creating these markets, you then want those bureaucratic states to not be controlled by the winners of those markets, 
because you don't want them to be overly dominated by the market forces. So you need blocks between the bureaucratic apparatus that's creating the markets and running the markets and regulating the markets and the markets themselves. And so you need mechanisms to actually result in a different kind of a world. And in that sphere, the bureaucratic sphere, you are then, obviously, going to face other dangers. And so if you have a bureaucratic sphere that will fall into all the dangers that we know of, of bureaucracies, you need other spheres to be pushing against them. And your goal is to constantly be creating these spheres that are, working, that are hopefully working on behalf of the other spheres, but not controlled by any ones of them. That's all very abstract, so let me give some very concrete examples of how, in different ways, this was put into play. So, when we think about the emergence of capitalism according to our modernity narratives, of course, the narrative, as I've mentioned, and now let me elaborate, basically runs along the argument that all of humans are controlled by these traditional societies that again involve things like rituals and all these things we need to get rid of until finally markets are allowed to develop. Once those markets are allowed to develop, they grow, that creates a middle class, the middle class overthrows these traditional authoritarian states, this leads to tremendous levels of freedom. Um, sadly, once that occurs in full by the 19th century, again, people develop different isms, most of which are wrong, but finally in the 1980s, 1990s, they come upon the true one, and the rest of the isms are wiped out, and we have great prosperity. Here's a counter way of thinking about this if we're going to finally drop this term modernity and all of the, I would say, historically wrong visions it's creating for us. Here's an alternate way of thinking about all of this. Um, if you go back to the period that turned out to be crucial historically, so 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, the entire Eurasian continent, Eurasia now, Eurasia and including the entire um, east coast of Africa, um, starts, you see across these, the development of extraordinary trade networks that are spreading through this entire area. These trade networks start leading to enormous levels of prosperity, and for lack of time we won't go through, it, go through all the variations, but let me mention a not random one for where we're going. Um, the way this is working out in China during this time is along the following lines. The trade networks are largely run through temple networks. Um, for the non-specialist, temple networks basically involve, they're based upon the worship of gods and goddesses. And what you're doing is, it's a very non-moist vision of the world to put it politely, what you're doing is dealing with these incredibly dangerous ghosts all around us with whom we fall into these horribly dangerous patterns of interaction. So ghosts are dead humans and dead humans tend to be vicious at us because we're alive, and they have anger and resentment because we're alive, and they tend to haunt those around their areas, but oftentimes particularly those most associated with them. Oftentimes aren't their own family members because they see us moving on with our lives, and they hate us, and they want to destroy. And so what you do when you're dealing with these, sort of the most dangerous of these dangerous patterns of interaction that things fall into, is you try to work with them ritually. And so one of the things you will do, for example, is you try to engage them in ritual relationships. These ritual relationships are not seen as socializing anyone into <laughs> some like, like worldview that they need to believe in sincerely. It's all based upon attempts to build relationships. The sense is these are always fragile relationships that often break down, can break down, but often frequently do, but sometimes they work. And with those related to us, we try to make those ghosts into ancestors, and we try to become good descendants, and we try to move from this dangerous pattern of, of antagonistic relations to a relationship in which we are actually supporting those who came before us, and they are supporting us because they are our ancestors and we're descendants. And again, this never works for any length of time. They always become dangerous and ghosty again, and we become, as we usually are, ugly <laughs> living human beings. Um, but the ritual is this constant attempt to create this alternate world as against the world we're otherwise living in. And you also 
can create these ritual relationships with other demonic figures, probably dead humans, but oftentimes we don't know where they really came from. We'll have different stories about who they may ultimately have been, but we don't really know. that There's these dangerous creatures out there. There are a lot of them. And these you try to make not into ancestors, they're not related to us, you try to make them into gods and goddesses. And when they start responding, what you start doing is you actually start building relationships with them. Um, let me just give you one concrete example, a very famous example, but for the non-specialists it's a very telling one. So um, there is a little girl, um, usually dated to the 14th century, um, who drowns off the southeast coast um, of China. It's usually seen as being in Fujian. And she drowns, she becomes a dangerous ghost, and she begins dragging other humans when they're sailing off on the ocean, dragging them down to join her in the abyss. As a dangerous ghost, therefore, you start trying to engage her because she's you know, very dangerous. And you start offering her ritual offerings, and she actually became very responsive. And so people begin offering her more, and she slowly starts becoming very supportive of sailors, to the point where if you're going to ever even think of sailing across the ocean, you would never not give her offerings. When she becomes responsive, she does indeed become a goddess, which means you give her the name of a goddess, you don't call her a deadly demon anymore, you give her a temple name, and her name, a um, very famous name, is Mazu. Um, and slowly, Every single person, if they're going to go in the ocean, is going to give offerings to Matsu. And so you get a temple being built to her of an entire community of people who support her. And then it becomes a network because, of course, people will continue sailing. And what you do is you develop ritual means by which this temple will actually grow. And so you have ritual bases by which you take this, the offerings of this temple, you literally, literally take a piece of the incense, and you move it to a different area. You found a new temple of the worship of Mazu, and if she's responsive there too, that becomes another temple in the network. And then because you're part of the network, as each node of these nodes develop, um, each node pays money back into the network, and this is the basis by which you fund the continuing growth of these temples. So if you ask, why do you get this extraordinary Chinese diaspora through Southeast Asia, um, it's literally funded by the temple network. In fact, Mazu isn't the only one, but Mazu is a significant one. And so as trade begins developing through Southeast Asia, almost everyone associated with the trade across the maritime regions is going to be part of a temple network to Mazu. Temple networks, therefore, begin spreading throughout Southeast Asia, which literally funds the creation of a new temple, which will mean an entire community will, will be growing up in different parts of Indonesia, part of this grand temple network. And it's through this temple network that, of course, the entire trade networks are developing. And then different trade networks can, can connect. And so if you're, say, in the manufacturing area and you want your goods sold in, to stick with that example, Southeast Asia, you would, of course, join the manufacturing trade network, which is based upon people doing manufacturing and worshiping gods and goddesses associated with that trade. And you would then do this, you would then connect as well with the maritime network because you would want your goods, of course, sold through that trade network. And so what you start getting is the emergence of these extraordinary trade networks that begin spreading over the subsequent centuries. And the key networks coming out of China are all working through these temple networks. Now, I won't, for lack of time, take you through all the variations of this going on throughout Eurasia, but as many of you can probably guess knowing about other parts of the world, um, this isn't just a Chinese story. These temple networks are spreading all over the place. And in fact, in Europe, the early merchant networks are very, very similar. Often based upon what we'll call saints, but it's very, very similar. These are these ritual trade networks that are developing throughout Eurasia. And you might correctly ask, if this is occurring, um, what about, as I mentioned before, this notion that you know, markets are not natural? So what about the state in all of this? Well, the state is at times trying and often failing to control all of this. So the notion that the st of the state at the time was, what you don't want is merchants who are successful in these trade networks, who in other words become successful in a financial basis, you don't want them 
to control the bureaucracy. That's the key. And so you need a break. The main break that's used at the time was the civil service exam, which by definition means you can only gain bureaucratic office if you become educated, take the exam, become educated meaning you leave your own local networks, oftentimes lineage networks, because they're usually from the elite groups, they're not part of temple networks, you have to lose, leave your lineage networks. If you succeed, you get a position in the bureaucracy, then, if you gain it, you're physically moved around because you don't want anyone in the bureaucracy in a local area to get too taken by local networks and literally become corrupted by them, and so you're constantly moving around to keep that break. And then if you can keep that break, the state is the thing that's doing things like running the legal system, that's doing things like running the public, building the public infrastructure that's making all of this possible, it keeps trying to kind of control the networks by doing things like raising significant gods and goddesses to the networks and giving them bureaucratic offices in the celestial framework, and the networks kind of respond or don't respond to this, and there's this kind of endless battle going on between these trade networks and the bureaucracy, an endless battle that proves to be incredibly productive for economies because you get a government focused on public infrastructure and you get these spreading trade networks. All of this is a pan-Eurasian phenomenon. I'm only discussing the Chinese example here, but again, you can expand variations of this throughout Eurasia. What is intriguing for the world we're living in is all of this comes when sets of powers geographically at the far extremes of Eurasia, England, <laughs> the Netherlands, Spain, who cannot gain access to these trade networks, Venice can, it's in the Mediterranean, and becomes fabulously wealthy. The ones on the far, far western coasts of Eurasia can't. And so they, of course, start trying to build boats to try to make it to these trade networks. Um, they try to go around the African coast and succeed, but it turns out it's really expensive, and so you can get to the trade networks, but it doesn't economically work out. And these, by the way, are all state-based. I mean, the state is paying for this. And then finally, of course, they decide to try to go the other way. They hit the Americas. And when they hit the Americas, um, most of the population is wiped out through disease and conquest. They get a de facto empty continent. And then using slave labor, they create an alternate economy across the Atlantic. And with that, they begin finally building effective states. And once they finally start building effective states in the 19th century, using that extraordinary military power they've developed through this Atlantic economy, then they finally start gaining access to the Asian trade networks, which was the goal all along. Only now it's not to trade with the trade networks, it's to physically take them over. And so you actually physically take over the key nodes in the trade networks, you make them into colonies, and you try to organize the entire world around a new economic system. That's the world we're living in. That's the world we're living in, except instead of thinking of it in the way I've just mentioned, we, by thinking of it in the modernity narrative, and even worse, in the neoliberal version of this modernity narrative, have actually wiped away all the history I just mentioned, which is readily there and available, wiped it away. All of that becomes a traditional world that then is read correctly as being based largely on ritual, but completely misread in terms of what ritual means, because you read it through the visions of these anti-ritual movements, these anti-ritual movements that are what I call sincerity movements. Sincerity movements being these attempts to build coherent worlds upon some single coherent vision of the self and trying to organize the entire world such that it really operates this way. Most sincerity movements are based upon the belief that it really is this way, one nice thing about Han Feidze is at least he admits it's not, <laughs> and at least admits that no, 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 think of this as a very chilling vision of how to create a world, and in a way that at least vision, as cynical and chilling as it is, at least makes clear what is in fact going on. Because if you buy into the system, if you, to give a not random example, buy into the idea that we have some true self, 
and that you should always be true to it and love it and base your life upon realizing this true self and choose your careers according to what's naturally given to you and accept the natural markets in which you can flourish because you're living up to your true self and in which states are deregulating so that they can allow these natural markets to work. The degree to which you believe such an absurd set of claims is the degree to which you, well, to put it strongly, haven't read your Han Feidze, or to put it more broadly, means the degree to which you are buying into the creation of a certain coherent world. So let's look at it from Han Feidze's point of view. And the first sets of points should be obvious to all of us, but they're worth making. Number one, there's nothing natural about this. Neoliberalism does not involve deregulation of any kind. It rather involves building incredibly strong administrative and bureaucratic structures to create markets. There's nothing natural about a market. And what deregulation means is you are not trying to regulate markets in certain ways. You're not trying to regulate markets in which you're worried about things like human interaction and, and, and modes of human flourishing, it means you're explicitly trying to take that away and define everything in terms of simple individual interactions according to the self-interest defined in a certain way that will benefit an extremely small minority. You then do everything you can to have that small minority be able to control the governmental process as much as humanly possible to the point of the extreme in America where they literally write the regulations of their own markets. And the argument for this is, well, they should because they're the ones who are successful in that given market and therefore they should write the regulations for it. But from the outside, what you're saying is, if you succeed, you can literally write the regulations in which you can continue <laughs> to succeed. So what you get is not an unregulated market. What you get is a set of monopolies who control the markets, and you have an incredibly strong governmental apparatus to run this. There's nothing natural. There's no deregulation whatsoever. It therefore should not be surprising that in one of these so-called populist uprisings leading to Trump, you get a president who, in fact, is a straight neoliberal, obviously. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> He's doing the exact same, at the more extreme level, the exact same policies that, that any neoliberal president would be doing, just a much more extreme version of them. Even Steve Bannon says our goal is to deconstruct the administrative state, which, again, doesn't mean get a, strong, a less strong state. What he really means is take away all of the last remaining regulations that the 1990s didn't get rid of, <laughs> but regulations, again, meaning regulations that are preventing a market from actually running the government. And you try to create a seamless order in which the government, the economy, the educational system are all operating on market principles, which requires an incredibly strong administrative state to create. Hein Feidze would say, congratulations, you all have finally done it. <laughs> Now, if this is the case, let me simply conclude with some comments. If there's something to this, we are living in one such sincerity movement that, yes, far from being a secularized world that we like to think we're living in, it's actually a sincerity movement that's based upon all the different kinds of isms that are based upon belief in a single coherent order and convincing ourselves we really live in such a world, even though it contradicts our obviously daily experience. And when we claim there's no alternative, that again is consistently the move that is always made in sincerity movements, because again, the key is you need everyone to fully believe. Han Feitz explicitly says this. That's why there has to be no alternative. That's why it has to be the end of history. That's why we must simply believe there's no alternative. If we simply begin to take indigenous theories from around the world seriously and begin to ask, um, do you have alternate ways of building political, economic, educational, social worlds? The answer is obviously yes. <laughs> Do these fit into our definition of traditional societies? Well, some, surely. A lot, not remotely. In fact, the ones I was mentioning, obviously <laughs> for, for reasons of making the following point, directly not only cut against our traditional modernity narratives, they are based upon radically different visions of how you would build orders. And note, too, part of the power of them. They are not based upon any kind of a claim of here is then the ism that we should be following. What type of a political order do we build? What type of an economic order do we build? 
They actually give you surprising little content. The argument rather is, rather what you're doing is endlessly trying to richly work with the world and create these, these separations between political spheres, economic spheres, educational spheres, and it's in that process that you open up the possibilities for creating effective worlds at any given moment, whatever that would mean, to see how it would work out. If we took these seriously, it would not only mean we would have a very effective means of critiquing neoliberalism, not simply by saying it's bad, obviously it's bad, but actually concretely developing different visions of what we should actually be doing. You also note immediately you gain, and correctly so, an immediate cynicism against any of the other dominant alternatives out there, including those emanating from China. Let me give an obvious example. China is now creating a new Confucianism that will be an alternate form of modernity. Be very cynical. <laughs> no, if Confucianism is made into an ism, needless to say, bam, already get very scared. And if it's going to be an alternate form of modernity, get really, really scared. Any attempts to build any kind of a coherent ism based upon claims of modernity be very, very wary of. On the contrary, could we begin to develop political, economic visions outside of modernity narratives, outside of sincerity claims of coherence? The answer to that is easily yes. Look at what has been done by human activity working to build political worlds for millennia. The reason we don't look at those is because it doesn't fit our modernity narrative. If you wipe those away, then suddenly you have centuries, and again, millennia, of attempts by peoples throughout the world to try to create worlds in which humans can flourish. Many have failed in all sorts of ways. I'll put it more strongly. They've all failed in all sorts of ways. All constructions fail in all sorts of ways. They also, for brief moments, have led to certain types of flourishing. And suppose we started taking them seriously and actually began to learn from the different ways that different approaches have led to certain types of flourishing and see the dangers when they've led to horribly dangerous patterns that we can hopefully learn from as well. That is a process, I would note, that humans have been doing for centuries, that process of learning from past failures that we have simply ceased because of our extraordinarily dangerous modernity narratives. Suppose we began that work again. Suppose, to get even more concrete, in the educational sphere, not only do we take it out of the market world that it's been, that it's been working in since the 1980s, and explicitly since the 1990s, suppose, on the contrary, in the educational sphere, we begin actively teaching these. So imagine future economists who aren't simply learning rational choice theory in behavioral economics, both of which assume different sort of variations of the same view of humans, Suppose you start learning economic theories from around the world. Indigenous, in this example, economic theories from China. Suppose in political theory classes, you're not simply looking at you know, neoliberalism and the other bad isms, or communism, socialism, fascism, the bad ones and the good one, but you're actually looking at political theories that have arisen throughout the world and political practices based upon them. They're failures, but yes, they're momentary moments of success. And suppose we train another generation of students who actively really start thinking and engaging with these alternate views of humans and possible modes of human flourishing. It's not just that, yes, obviously there are alternatives suddenly, <laughs> obviously, but then you are also creating individuals, and I'll use some of this terminology that I've been sort of playing on or touching on only very briefly, individuals who, yes, see themselves in the world as messy and are looking at different types of worlds that can be created and doing so actively, preventing, therefore, the dangers of falling into isms and modernity narratives that cut out the real work that can make us as least capable as humans for flourishing. If we start creating that type of an educational world and students so trained, again, it's not just that there are alternatives, there are endless alternatives. <laughs> and part of what we're doing is helping that generation of students realize of course there are other possibilities, endlessly so, and we should again begin the work or return to the work that humans were doing for centuries and start trying to create better worlds. And we will fail. Every ritual fails. The ancestors always become ghosts again, of course, but then you begin again.
And that work is the work I think we are chillingly not teaching our students to engage in when we teach them about neoliberal ways of thinking and when we give them modernity narratives. Even when we say that neoliberalism is dangerous, we're not really giving a sense of what else could be possible. This, I think, is a concrete way. We're in the classroom, we could begin doing it, and then you're training an entire generation of students who could hopefully see through the very dangerous political worlds they're currently living in and truly begin trying to create alternate worlds, most again of which will fail, but if you at least see them as active constructions, you take that failing process seriously and you continue to learn from that as well. That is a world we could create and what really scares me about neoliberalism, on top of the things that we correctly note, the horrible disparities of wealth, the horrible degradation of the environment, all of which are horrible, among the things we should be equally chilled about is we're not training students who are really even equipped to actually begin actively thinking about alternatives. And this, I think, is a way to do it, not by creating new isms, but by creating alternate visions of what we could potentially become as human beings. Great, thank you so much. Thanks very much. We're going to have an extended conversation tomorrow at 6 o'clock, but we have some time now. We have at least 15, 20 minutes for some questions, and I would be very surprised after such a talk if there were no <laughs> questions. Who would like to start? Please. Hi. Uh, we don't have a roving mic, so could you bear that? Please, thank you. Mm, yes, a wonderful question. And in fact, to make a grand generalization, almost all of them. So the ones I would potentially exclude would be these sincerity movements, but even those potentially, because of course in practice they're assuming it, and all the rest of them, yes. So the underlying vision of really all of them, apart from the sincerity movements, and I would say even ultimately we should include those, it's really what we as human beings are, are essentially the worlds of relationships that we are falling into, often passively and dangerously so, but we could actively begin engaging in those relationships. Either way, they will define us. So what we are as human beings, by definition, is based upon the connections we form with each other, with the ghosts, the gods, the goddesses, everything. And either we do that passively, or we do it actively, but either way, that will define what we and those around us are. It's a, a fundamentally connected view. So thank you. I agree completely. Other questions? Yes. Could you conceive of the market as a ritual? Mm, yes. <laughs> I, I would love to conceive of the market as a ritual. And the reason I say that is the danger of the market is when we don't, like, right, so when we actually think the market is some natural thing, that's the word that's often used by, by at least rational choice um, theory economists, it's a natural thing if the state simply stops its bad regulations, people will naturally engage in market activity because we're inherently self-interested creatures, and once we do so, we will engage in the proper natural thing humans should do, which will naturally lead to economic prosperity. If, on the contrary, we think of it as a lot of the economic theorists from, from China were doing, as ritual activity, then you're explicitly saying, no, 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 we're creating, again, that's the word, we're creating spheres in which market-based work is occurring. And then once you're seeing that as a thing that you're creating, then you immediately need to start asking the questions, and what are the other spheres we can create to work against them, <laughs> against the dangers of that type of a sphere of activity? And once you're thinking of it that way, it's a ritual, it's a constructed world. Like all constructed worlds, it creates yet more ghosts that we then need to work against as well. And if we're thinking of it that way, it's not only, I think, a much more powerful way of thinking about it, it builds in, by definition, the necessity of realizing there is nothing natural about it, a market, and therefore we should always be self-conscious about what types of a market we're choosing to create, and that becomes a question we can always pose leads to a completely different way of thinking about economic theory. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much for your, for your talk today. Um, taking a, a broader historical perspective, you yes. talked about a few, a few different uh, time periods in which uh, there's been a transition between these different uh, sort of organizing yes. theories, what I call them. So, you know, one was you know, uh, European colonization yes. of, of China, which obviously was, it was a violent process, and then you know, more recently the rise of neoliberalism, which really ideas are. Potentially, you could argue it's, it's a very, um, uh, you know, it's a very disruptive process that could lead to violent transitions. Do you have hope that there is, is a path for more ideational shifts between these different organizing theories, or do you see that as like a process that, that leads to violence? Um, great question. Um, to make a grand generalization, um, and, and like all general, grand generalizations, there are tons of exceptions, but I think hopefully at least some grand generalizations are worth thinking about nonetheless. And here's one that might be worth thinking about. I think most of the kinds of enforced violences we're talking about here come out of, again, while well, I'm very broadly calling these sincerity movements, that, which I would include very strongly things like, like neoliberalism, et cetera, because they're based upon, that's even putting it too mildly, they require the claim that there can be nothing outside of them, right? I mean, the key for a sincerity claim is you need to create a coherent world where everyone lives and there can be nothing outside of it. And that requires getting everyone to, and I'll use different words, to convert or be forced to join, <laughs> um, you, must, you must expand and you must include everyone. Part of the drive of neoliberalism, it's not just that you need to say, there are no alternatives, you must believe it's the end of history, etc. I mean, you need to expand to include the entire globe because by definition, if there are things outside of it, that's a problem, which is why, again, you label them traditional and therefore things that haven't yet sadly joined the modern world because they ultimately have to for this to work. So it requires an inherent form of violence. If, on the contrary, you're assuming a world of messiness where you're constructing these alternate worlds, now, you can have horribly violent constructions, <laughs> so that's not going to save you, but it at least opens the possibility of recognizing your goal is to have different spheres. Like, that's an intentional goal. And therefore, radically different spheres, both within a given society as well as across the globe, is an inherently good thing by definition, because no one sphere is going to be you know, a good sphere. <laughs> the spheres will only be productive if they're working against other spheres in some kind of productive tension. And so at least it allows the possibility of, of being cognizant of the kinds of violence any one sphere is creating and hopefully creates the possibility of people seeing that violence and working against it by alternate spheres. So you know, just to give an obvious example from China, if you create certain types of, of of marketplace violence in which people are becoming incredibly wealthy and others are being impoverished, you hopefully will have a state apparatus that won't be controlled by those who are becoming wealthy in the market that can then step in. And so your goal is to endlessly create spheres that can hopefully see the violence within any one sphere and respond to it. In the sincerity movement, that's precisely what you take off the table, which means we can be incredibly violent, and the world is stunningly so, and not even aware of the horrible violence we're in fact creating. So great, thank you. And would you go so far as to suggest that the violence is endemic to your system? Oh, so yeah. Person, and therefore, what you're suggesting is it's better to manage violence than pretend that violence to be stupid. Is that? Oh, yeah, and I'll even use their terms, which are kind of even more chilling than that way of putting it, but I think it's, they're kind of helpful. I mean, the way they'll talk about it is you're never going to get rid of the ghosts, by which they mean these horribly dangerous patterns of interaction. And again, we have ghostly sides within us while we're alive. It's, not, it's just that after death, they become you know, full force resentment and fear, but they're already here. So you're not going to get rid of that. If the, what you're trying to do with the, all these ritual workings and, and, and creating different spheres, you're, you're trying to work with the ghosts. You don't get rid of them. But that's valuable because the sincerity movement tends to be based upon a claim, oh no, we'll create the perfect utopia. And you're in part saying, no, 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 we know we won't, and therefore, it's endless work. Michael, is science the ultimate sincerity? Ooh. <laughs> um, yes, or, or at least, yeah. I mean, it's a great question, and it depends entirely on how it's done. And so if, as we often do dangerously assume, that 
for example, you know, economics, rational choice economics, is a science, and we should therefore, from that point of view, assume that science is based upon finding real, actual laws that are there that we're simply observing, and so rational choice economics is simply accepting that humans are these self-interested creatures, and then correctly building a marketplace and a political world and an educational world upon that objective fact, incredibly dangerous. Now, clearly part of the, what's implicit in your argument, which I accept, and it's part of the, the goal of the Needham Research Institute, is to say um, there are alternate sort of theories, but equally importantly practices of science that involve no such claim involve rather claims that if it's, if it's this messy world, what we're doing with sciences is we're exploring these different patterns that develop. And even calling them laws can be a little risky because a law is an attempt to base an absolute system of regularity, which with humans and maybe the natural world, building on a lot of indigenous theories from China, um, is a wrong way to think about it. Think rather about these patterns that you're exploring and patterns are ever shifting. And think of it that way. And let me just note as a minor footnote to make the point, one of the architects of neoliberalism, before I think he really realized he might be successful, actually agreed with this. So Milton Friedman in the 1950s, you know, when he was just this bizarre fringe crazy, <laughs> um, actually wrote an essay where he gives this away. And he says, well, I know people aren't really self-interested creatures, obviously, but if we create a world that works this way, increasingly they'll act that way. Which is basically, you know, Han Feitz would say, yes, that's right, <laughs> that's right. So he gives it away. Then, of course, once he becomes big, he realizes, mm, don't ever say that. <laughs> and so then rational choice economics all becomes, oh no, people are really this way. It's a science in that definition. But the truth is, you can do science differently, and if you're doing science without that claim, I wouldn't even say assumption, without that claim, then you have a very productive way of mapping and working with patterns in the world, and that's an incredibly powerful way to think about science. Great, thank you. Um, I think similarly to ask about law as the yes. reality, so if, that, if law today is seen as powerful because it is predictive, um, what role would law play in your study? Yes, so I'll begin with the dangerous view. So, Law for Han Feidza, I mean, Han Feidza is again this theorist I was saying gives a very chilling vision of, of a world that we're kind of living in. For him, the key is you want the laws to be so regularized and so consistent that no one will even over time think of them as laws. It'll just be what you do. Um, you know, one example, if you're driving along a road in America and you see a red light, you don't stop because you're afraid that you might suffer a horrible punishment. I mean, you also stop if it's in the middle of the, say, Midwest, and it's the middle of the night, and there's obviously no policeman around. You stop because it just becomes so much a part of your way of being. It just is what you do. And that vision of law is, it's the consistency, it's the regularity, that you just want it to become so much a part of people's patterns of interaction. Now, what I would say are the more productive ways of thinking about human flourishing, they would say, well, of course you need laws. But understand laws are always human constructions, and you're actually trying to highlight that. So when you create laws to regulate a market, and all markets are regulated by laws, despite the claims of deregulation, they're all run by powerful states. If you do that, then you explicitly want a political sphere that is, you're making as self-conscious as humanly possible that it's doing this, and then it's that tension between the market and the political sphere that can be productive. And so they are, yes, you need laws, but you make it as clear as possible to human construction, and then you try to prevent any one set of vested interests to controlling them too much, because as soon as they do, of course, if it's the political sphere, it will become corrupted because it'll be controlled by market forces and blah, 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 blah. So you try to break up the spheres such that the construction of laws becomes an active part of the, of the work that we humans are doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Professor Hughes, thank you for the very um, critical and inspiring talk. And uh, my question actually uh, has nothing, nothing to do with market or, or, or that kind of stuff, but it's more like, um, it seems to me that you are studying Chinese history or Chinese philosophy from the point of the present from, from your perspective, so which is 21st century American society. And uh, one question often we face in history is that if we 
study history, like if we're so involved in the present and we study history, and of course there is a strong moral position here, but very, very often people criticize. Yeah, absolutely. For like, or us for being yeah. like unscholarly. So I would like to hear how would you express yourself? Yeah, no, great question. And one of the absolute untouchable rules of the current era, and intriguingly, by the way, it dates to the same time period we're talking about, um, is always historicize, always contextualize. And you know, we're all, we used to be taught this, now it's beyond being taught this. We just, it's so much a part of what we do, we take it for granted. And my response to the view, always historicize and always contextualize, is yes, but recognize the complexities of historicizing and contextualizing. And what I mean by that is the following. Um, I do lots of very, very intense contextualized work on early Chinese society, um, in which I'm trying as much as possible to work out the, the complex debates of the day. Um, but yes, I also try to do kind of what I would consider the theoretical work of saying, what happens if we take these positions being taken and sort of pull them out of that historical and contextualized context and think of, of history and context in a much larger sense, and then really think comparatively, how do we wrestle with these different ways of conceptualizing human flourishing? And I would say this is equally contextualizing and equally historicizing. I mean, this is the work I look at, at Sir Jeffrey um, in the audience. I mean, this is the work of comparison in which you're recognizing that the danger of always historicized and always contextualized, meaning only look at one thing in its immediate historical context, is a potentially very powerful way of thinking. It's also potentially a very dangerous way of thinking. And while I do that too, um, I also want to be aware of the potential dangers of that because it means you can spend your life doing such intense specialized work that nothing that you're working with actually allows you to question the world we're currently living in. And part of the work of doing larger comparative forms of contextualization is precisely that it allows that to be possible. And so, going back to the argument of different spheres, I would say, for the future researchers in the audience, do both. <laughs> and, and hopefully not just as those two alternatives. Do the intense historical contextualization in the usual way we mean, mean that, but do the much broader comparative and theoretical contextual work too. And hopefully by doing both of those, and hopefully the other possibilities too, you'll hopefully again be doing the work of seeing the dangers of any one approach. And the more different approaches you work on, the more you'll see you know, the ghosts we're wrestling with than the ghosts we're creating by, by our work and how to wrestle with them in turn. So yeah, I would say that's one of those orthodoxies we should be very, not, not that we should not do, but that we should be very wary of the dangers of. So yeah, thank you. On that happy note of wrestling, <laughs> wrestling with ghosts, a very Cambridge idea, I think, wrestling with ghosts. I'd like us all, please, again, once, once again, to thank Michael for a wonderful lecture.